John Loxton is a professor emeritus of political science and international affairs, and also the founder of the Space Policy Institute at the Elliott School of International Affairs at George Washington University. He is internationally recognized as a consummate historian and analyst of space issues, and is widely praised in the space community from astronauts to scientists to media uh, to science communicators. Uh, if you want to find any information about him, Google his name and he is everywhere. Uh, you'll also see him quoted in much of the evidence that we'll be using uh, in the debate at debatetrack.com, but also in any kind of research that you do. Uh, Professor Lakshin, welcome. Good to be with you. So in preparing for this interview, I've reviewed your other interviews on the Space Force. Um, you've done many of them. Uh, and I hope to try to cover some unique aspects of the topic. So uh, to start simple, Next month, we'll have students across America debating if the benefits of creating the U.S. Space Force outweigh the harms. In other words, on that, is it, is it a good or bad thing? Uh, as with any debate topic, there's no simple answer to this question. Uh, nevertheless, I'd like to hear your initial reaction. Uh, does the Space Force strike you as on net more harmful or beneficial? Well, I think it remains to be seen. I mean, after all, it is just uh, a year and a few months in existence. And uh, it takes a while for an organization like this to get itself together. I mean, it now has a flag. It has uh, it, it, its uh, members are going to be called guardians. It's going to use military, uh, not Navy ranks. Uh, but. Uh, Basically, it, it, there's a transition period of taking over existing functions that will, I think, last at least a few more years. So I think the, the ability to say, is it worth it? Do the benefits outweigh the uh, costs uh, is, is a question for five, 10 years from now. Uh, you know, you, uh, I'm sure we'll talk about why was it created uh, and and uh, we'll see whether uh, those reasons will justify the existence of, I mean, what are the costs? Uh, 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 a, a new uniform, uh, a, a new structure, uh, uh, a new headquarters uh, somewhere. Um, uh, uh, I mean, they, these are people who would be working for the military anyway. So it's really just a transfer of budget. It's not a, a, a major new budget item. So economic costs are not really that significant now. They could be in the future. So uh, it remains to be seen. It could end up being a huge force for good. It could end up leading to disaster. There's no real way of knowing uh, one year in. It's still an infant of a program with minimal costs and minimal benefits. Well, and also you got to define good and disaster yes. in what you just said. I mean, a force for the good. If it's a force for a more effective use of space assets to protect U.S. national security, that's a good thing, for at least from the U.S. point of view. Right. A disaster would be, I guess, leading to an outbreak uh, or even an unnecessary outbreak of armed conflict in an environment that hasn't seen armed conflict. So that would be a bad thing. I don't know whether it would be a disaster, but it would be, a, uh, from my point of view, a bad thing. Right. Uh, I guess I say disaster only in that some disasters spring from things that aren't really anyone's fault. But when you get to the biggest military that the world has ever seen, a small change can lead to big results in the end. Um, yeah, so I mean, remember this is only 16,000 people. By comparison, the Air Force has 329,000 people. So mm -hmm. this is, is and will probably continue to be a very small separate service, not some big massive military operation. So in other words, if it did lead to some sort of armed conflict, that might not be because of the Space Force per se, uh, even if it was involved in some kind of a conflict. It could be because of other 
uh, international affairs because of things the military would be involved in anyway. Exactly. I mean, uh, I mean, if uh, if some adversary attacks U.S. satellites, they're going to be uh, countered. They're going to be uh, the satellites are going to be defended. Uh, here's a kind of geeky thing: the space force doesn't actually fight. Hmm. The space force prepares to fight, but the actual combat would be the uh, U.S. Space Command, which is a war fighting command in our military system of organization. So the Space Force prepares, uh, gets the equipment, trains the people, gets the theory of how to fight a war in space, but it would be a different organization, not the Space Force. Might be the same people, but under different command that would do the actual fighting. That makes sense. I do notice in many of your interviews that uh, people raise this question about militarization, uh, about the increase of international tensions, about testing of space weapons leading to space debris, things like that. And it seems like you don't see this as a political threat. And I guess this is why, yes? Well, first of all, space has been militarized since 1957. Uh, uh, I mean, the first U.S. space program that got approved after Sputnik was a uh, intelligence satellite called Corona for military and national security purposes. Uh, so the military has made use of space assets uh, since the beginning of the ability to put things in space. Uh, the, the issue is not militarization, it is weaponization. Uh, and and the, the I mean, to, fortunately to date, there has been no armed conflict uh, in the space environment. And most of what the space uh, capabilities of the United States have been deployed for is to support land, sea, or air forces, not fight on their own. Uh, there now, if you use satellites as essential to your military operations, then they become targets. Uh, and that leads to the issue of a counter space and anti-satellite weapons. And there are a, a wide variety of anti-satellite or counter space weapons. The ones that get all the attention are the so-called kinetic kill weapons, which you know hit a satellite, blow it up, and create a lot of space debris. Uh, there hasn't been much of that. China tested uh, a kinetic weapon against its own satellite in 2007. And that's about the last time that there's been a demonstration of kinetic kill capability. There are lots of other less destructive ways to uh, attack uh, a satellite, cyber attacks, so laser beams, uh, electronic interference. So uh, again, you have to be fairly careful in defining what you're talking about. It makes sense. Uh, there was even, I don't know, two years ago, a Russian test of kind of a novel weapon. Yes, uh, a satellite, a co-orbital satellite to satellite weapon. Well, it's not a weapon until you do something with it. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> I mean, we, uh, there was a, a Russian satellite that co-orbited with a U.S. intelligence satellite. It was, kind of, it was kind of, next kind of, to it, but... It, it, but it didn't do anything, or it didn't do anything harmful, as far as we know. Mm. Uh, so is that a weapon? Uh, I, I would say no until... It's, it's a demonstration of a particular capability. But after all, we've been rendezvousing in space uh, since the Gemini program of the mid 1960s and the equivalent Russian capability. So the idea that you can fly one satellite up uh, and, and rendezvous in close proximity to another one is nothing new. Uh, the question is what your intent and then what your behavior is once you do that. Hmm. 
There's um, on the converse side of militarization, there's an argument that we definitely need to be militarizing space uh, because space assets are obviously crucial to everything in our lives, but also a huge part of the economy valued at trillions of collective dollars uh, and also, of course, crucially vital for our military. Uh, do you think this is a, a valid argument that the space force was was needed in order to manage these uh, assets? Or uh, do you think the argument that this is kind of superfluous and just a political tool or talk uh, makes more sense? Well, uh, first of all, that function of defending satellites was always there. It belonged to the Air Force. You know, what the Space Force has done is taken over the space mission that formerly belonged to the US Air Force. So to that degree, there's nothing new. Now, there is an open issue of what is being defended. Is it just US military satellites, the satellites that communicate, that observe the Earth, that, that, that uh, uh, allow our uh, armed forces to be effective in conflict? Is, is that the limitation? Or does the Space Force now have the responsibility of protecting private operations in space? Uh, Multi-billion dollar communication satellites, not billion, multi-million dollar communication satellites. And once we get downstream and there are uh, commercial operations in space, uh, you know, is the, 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 our Navy protects our commercial ships on the ocean. Will the Space Force protect commercial mining operations uh, or uh, other commercial activities in space? Those are the kind of open questions as the organization evolves. So this could be a big role of the Space Force, but we don't know. We just simply don't have a clear answer without looking into the future. Right, it remains to be determined. At this point, I think the function of the Space Force, a function of the Space Force is to defend uh, US national security space assets, uh, either defend by uh, threatening uh, retaliation or by protecting them uh, in, in, in some sort of electronic or other technological means. Hmm. Um, you have been involved in the in the space scene, as it were, for uh, many decades. Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, I mean, my first big space memory, well, or two. One is seeing John Glenn parade through Manhattan after his 1962 flight, and then being at the launch of Apollo 11 in 1969. Wow. So uh, I have been at this a long time. Uh, so you do, with this kind of very long vision, uh, you've doubtless had a, a keen eye on U.S. space policies, uh, U.S. policies towards space, and also how, how it's changed all the time, uh, over time, how, how the U.S. Has, a, has approached space over time. Um, how do you see the creation of the Space Force in the context of uh, historical policy and maybe where, more importantly, where do you hope, where do you hope U.S. space policy heads towards, let's say, in the future? Well, uh, I mean, we we didn't make space assets. Now, let's let's make a, a differentiation here, and it's important to understand this. There are space systems provide information, intelligence, spy satellites, however you want to use that, operated by the National Reconnaissance Office. Those satellites are not part of the Space Force. They are not owned, they're not operated they're, uh, by the Space Force. The National Reconnaissance Office remains as a separate organization. So, and then there are those satellites for military communications, military weather forecasting, uh, military earth observation, damage assessment, seeing uh, war warning of incoming threats 
to us early warning satellites. So there are a whole set of satellites operated by the Department of Defense uh, now by the Space Force mm. uh, uh, that provide these military functions. Uh, they did not really become critical to our way of fighting wars until mm, now 1991, the Persian Gulf War, so 30 years ago. And in those 30 years, there's been a policy debate. Uh, well, from this, before that, there was a policy debate of whether to develop and deploy space weapons to attack the space capabilities of other countries. And that debate came rather consistently out in the negative, that space weapons were destabilizing and a bad idea. And the United States certainly should not be first to develop and deploy them, mm. much less use them. Now, space has become more important to us. Uh, and so we're concerned about the protection of our space systems that we use for war fighting on Earth. Uh, and, and how best to do that is an ongoing debate. Do you uh, create international agreements to not attack one another satellites? Is there a diplomatic solution to uh, space security? Or do you need deterrence to threaten, if you hurt us, we'll hurt you worse. Mm. So don't hurt us. Mm. Uh, you know, which leads to, to uh, space weapons capabilities. So that debate is, continues and the Space Force is intended to be among its other functions to think through these issues as inputs into national policy. Hmm. Um, in terms of politics, it seems that a lot of the, the public perception about the creation of the Space Force was colored by how polarizing Trump is as a figure. Uh, do you think there's any unique benefits or harms to the fact that uh, Trump was the one who, um, I don't know if made it happen is the right phrasing, but who at least uh, was in leadership when the Space Force was formally uh, created? Well, uh, I'm, I'm sure that uh, the people here you're going to use this will know some of the history that the idea of a separate space force has been around a long time hmm. uh, and and in the past decade was advocated by both uh, republican and democratic members of congress particularly in our house of representatives uh, and the argument there was that the air force was full of pilots and focused on airplanes and air power and air war, and that space was too important to be ignored. And it was to some degree being ignored within the Air Force. Air Force says no to that, of course, but, but that was the argument. And so that was the reason to create a separate organization uh, for the effective use of space power. Uh, that was there. Trump learned about it, seized on it, and it was just the kind of thing that appealed to his personality. Uh, and so he, he had the polarizing impact of talking about space dominance and, and ordering, uh, uh, much to his surprise, an Air Force general to figure out how to create the Space Force and then signing the directive uh, in, in 2019 that, that created the Space Force. And so it's been associated with the particular personality of Donald Trump and colored by it. Now he's gone. And I'll keep my politics out of this, but uh, now he's gone. Uh, wow. And so President Biden will have to, over the coming weeks and months and years, uh, figure out what evolutionary path there will be for this organization. Uh, the White House has said it will continue. Uh, there, there's no intention to, to undo the creation of the Space Force. Uh, and so figuring out exactly what role it will perform in both the near and long term is now Joe Biden's responsibility. And he's a very different personality than Donald Trump. 
do you think the president has a uh, a large a large role or a large influence in shaping how that happens? Uh, Biden, for example, um, I'm sure is some fan or uh, supporter of space missions, but he's hardly a space expert. That's hardly hardly his thing. So how much of it do you think is sort of the natural evolution um, led by generals and by people in the bureaucracy, people in the Space Force or the Air Force versus uh, the president's ideas of what should happen? Well, it, it must be pointed out that among his responsibilities, the American president is the commander in chief of the armed forces. So all the generals work for him. <laughs> uh, and, and I mean, Joe Biden is one of the most experienced top of the government people we've ever had as president. So while he may not be uh, a, a, a space expert, uh, he has followed national security strategy as a senator, eight years as a vice president. Uh, so, uh, you know, he's very well qualified to understand at the level of national strategy and national policy and international diplomacy where the Space Force will fit in. Uh, I, I think, you know, uh, he's, he's indicated his support of space overall by bringing a moon rock into the Oval Office. Uh, yeah, that's cool. A pretty cool thing. Uh, so, uh, and, and indicating our program to uh, go back to the moon uh, will continue. Uh, so he's going to be, uh, I think, a strong supporter of a space program that protects and promotes U.S. national interests. Uh, how that translates into his attitude towards uh, the role and, and mission of the Space Force remains to be seen. Hmm. I, I think this is so telling of how much of an expert you are that you're not giving any very simple yes or no answers. Things actually are complicated in the real world and you can't actually yeah. predict the future. Well, I, I, I mean, after all, a career academic, we, we call it. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Um, so uh, this interview really is is for these students who are practicing the sport of debate. And in debate, you you do want to be able to take some hard positions on one side or the other. So if you can uh, blow up the impacts of um, something like the Space Force to be sort of apocalyptic or to be kind of not a big deal or to be extremely helpful and save humanity, uh, that's what's going to end up winning you debates. So there are some very high impact, uh, but low probability uh, celestial events that people often reference in talking about the Space Force, at least in popular media, namely asteroids and solar flares, uh, maybe to an even lesser extent aliens. Uh, how do you think about the role of the government in mitigating these very low probability yet clearly existential uh, risks? Well, let's go to planetary defense uh, <laughs> against asteroids or comets impact. Killed the dinosaurs, could kill us. Uh, mm. It's not a question of if, it's only a question of when a large object will hit the Earth, unless we figure out ways of defending against that uh, occurrence. Uh, I won't even call it a probability. It's going to happen. It might be 10 million years from now, but uh, let's hope it's not next week. Hmm. Uh, uh, the responsibility for planetary defense is not clearly defined in US policy. Uh, currently, NASA is the only organization that is spending significant amount of money on planetary defense. And it's doing it in order to uh, identify and locate and identify potential objects that might uh, intersect with the Earth. Uh, uh, so uh, that, that is a conceivable, I would say even kind of a probable role hmm. in the long term for the Space Force is to take over the responsibility for 
defending the Earth against attacks uh, from from natural objects uh, hmm. uh, uh, and aliens, for that matter. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> there is there is a, uh, a a book by one of my former students, which uh, high school debaters should not read. It's too dense of reading. It's called Dark Skies. Uh, by Daniel Dudney, D-E-U-D-N-E-Y. And he talks about aliens, that there are aliens and they don't necessarily be friendly and that there could well be alien attacks on human civilization. I, I will leave that to Dan. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, the physics of it are pretty complicated anyway. Um, uh, you talk about solar flares. Well, there's not much you can do about a solar flare except uh, protect things uh, from disruption by solar energy. Uh, so I, I don't, it's not quite clear to me where something like the Space Force would uh, fit in in, in uh, uh, that kind of natural, protecting against that kind of natural phenomena. Not it's that it's not concept. a potential danger, but you're not going to shoot a solar flare out of the sky. No, no. <laughs> I think mean, that's it's it's a wave of energy, uh, you know. So uh, uh, there's really no defense against it except shielding. Well, again, it's our uh, atmosphere is a pretty good, and, and magnetic field is a pretty good shield. But if you're talking about people, humans, uh, long term on the moon or Mars or transiting through uh, space and they encounter uh, the, the radiation from a solar flare, they're going to have a bad day. Hmm. Hmm. Um, I'm really happy you mentioned this. It, this is actually was not in one of my list of questions, but I was thinking about it. Um, how do you see um, the, the relationship between the Space Force and NASA as either having missions that dovetail or Space Force draining resources from NASA. Uh, what's your thoughts on this? Well, I mean, their missions are different. Hmm. So fundamentally, they're separate organizations. They have agreed to collaborate where there is an overlap of interest in things like developing technologies. Uh, and, and, and so there, there will be some interactions at the engineering technical level, but not in the mission level. I mean, their, their purposes are so fundamentally different. Uh, uh, so uh, I don't think there's much more to say than that. that. I mean, it's, uh, the, the Space Force is going to get its people these days from the Air Force. I mean, the Congress passed a provision that said that people from the uh, Navy or the Army cannot transfer to the Space Force, only people from the Air Force. Hmm. So, uh, and, and then uh, people who uh, uh, graduate from our Air Force Academy can choose a Space Force career. So that's where the people are going to come from. They're not going to come out of NASA. Well, of course, I guess you could quit NASA, uh, but NASA is a civilian organization. I mean, the, the Space Force, most of it will be uniformed military people. They're going to be called guardians. Mm. Uh, there'll be a civilian management structure, but it's mainly uh, uniformed military and NASA's uh, civil servants not military people. Mm -hmm. So operating in some of the same domains, but uh, just different missions. Well, I mean, uh, let's take a, a, a not terribly hypothetical example. If NASA establishes long-term scientific bases on the moon or Mars, will there be a Space Force responsibility to protect those bases? Uh, from what? I don't know. Uh, but if, if, if there were threats uh, uh, to, to uh, the U.S. forces, would it be the Space Force that protects uh, those installations uh, conceivably? Hmm. All right. Final you know, question. 
well, and, and again, the private sector plays in this. If Elon Musk <coughs> uh, uh, is able to uh, achieve his goal of a million person city on Mars, hmm. who's going to defend that? You know, will it be a Martian space force, uh, or will it become a responsibility? Certainly, it's, it's military responsibility to tend cities on Earth. So, you know, uh, is that responsibility extended? Uh, speaking of of Elon Musk, there's, um, I mean, as you say, there are uh, already now, but also an increasing amount of private satellites uh, and he's been launching a lot of these mini sets for uh, uh, beam internet everywhere where on earth there's a couple well, other uh, companies that are so trying to do the same thing mega constellations and and so you so one could feel the argument that the space force is needed to protect these satellites but uh, why would they need protection uh, who's trying to shoot down internet satellites? Uh, at this point, fortunately, nobody. <laughs> but if they become critical, I mean, a lot of critical military communications go via commercial satellites. <coughs> and so if there are attempts to disrupt those uh, 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 communications, uh, again, I think it would be a Space Force responsibility, uh, first order, and maybe if it gets to be an active conflict, then the Space Command to provide defense against those uh, disruptions. This makes sense. Uh, so final question, have you ever met an alien? Uh, I met some strange people along the way. Uh, I've had this is funny, but it's true. I've had two or three times in my life, colleagues who I thought were sane say they're here and they want to meet you. Uh, and I've always said no. <laughs> so, uh, so the answer to your question is no. But the, the second answer is I've been offered the opportunity. That's that's amazing. Like. Uh... I, I, I'm, I'm curious that even people who work in um, sp the space uh, industry or space field uh, could also entertain the notion that they have some communication with aliens, yes? Yes. <laughs> and maybe they do. Uh, Professor Logston, thank you so much for joining us. This conversation will be very helpful to many students. Okay, good to be with you. Hey, you, you too. Bye-bye. Right,